Released in 2002, Die Another Day is not only Pierce Brosnan's fourth and final Bond film, but also the 20th film in the 007 franchise overall. Originally, this film was going to be directed by Michael Apted, the director of The World Is Not Enough, but for some reason, producers Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson later rescinded that offer and began a search for a different director. They went through many potential candidates, some like Tony Scott and John Woo, who both declined, and others that were suggested by even Pierce Brosnan, such as Ang Lee. There were even negotiations with Stephen Hopkins, Brett Ratner, and Stuart Baird, but none actually went through. Finally, the studio settled on director Lee Tamahori. Lee was not the first choice for the film, and some wonder if retaining the world is not enough director Michael Apted would have been a better choice, as his film, despite its flaws, is not nearly as criticized as Die Another Day. I previously reviewed GoldenEye, Tomorrow Never Dies, and The World Is Not Enough. I love the Bond movies and games, and I'd like to actually make more content about them and try and swing back to movie reviews once or twice a month at least. It's just been a time issue because these are a bit of a big project. This film is often remembered as the movie that almost killed the James Bond franchise, as it's been ridiculed and criticized by many, but it's important to note that it was actually incredibly successful during its theatrical run. With a budget of 142 million US dollars, Die Another Day made about 430 million dollars at the time worldwide, which, at the time, was the highest grossing Bond film ever released. This is the final Bond film starring Pierce Brosnan as Bond, and it also marks the final entry in the loose cinematic continuity of the original James Bond character. Many don't know this, but even though every Bond actor's respective eras can be treated as their own stories, there were actually connections and references throughout all the Bond films to this point, and that means that whether you jumped on with Goldeneye, starting with Pierce, or maybe you had been watching since the days of Doctor No and Sean Connery, there was actually a rich and storied history for this character that many believe ended with Die Another Day. That said, this version of James Bond is sort of immortal, not in the sense that he can't die, but in the sense that he never would. This Bond actually did find a way to survive, crawling out of the wreckage that was the critical reception of Die Another Day, and had one last adventure in the video game 007 Everything or Nothing, which acts as a sort of final adventure for the original James Bond, with even Pierce Brosnan returning to lend his likeness and voice acting to the game. That game also ties loosely to the game's Agent Under Fire and Nightfire, so there are more Bond stories that fans can experience if they want to, and these games are a subject that I will actually return to in future videos. Unfortunately, the fallout of Die Another Day is a real thing. Brosnan was unfairly blamed for this film, and I've often seen him pointed to as the actor who both saved, with Goldeneye, the original Bond franchise, but also almost killed it because of his connection to Die Another Day, but I don't think this could be further from the truth or more unfair. The film was honestly troubled from the start, between having issues finding a director to even script writing issues, and as detailed in the book Some Kind of Hero 007, the remarkable story of James Bond films, the original story of this film was set to be much different as well. I actually am working on a rejected media episode about this in the future, but to add a brief explanation, this film was originally going to feature the Icarus laser launching an attack on Manhattan in the climax of the story. Now, while this draft was being directly worked on, the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks happened that destroyed the US World Trade Center in New York, and this attack left the writing team absolutely devastated, along with director Lee Tamahori. So, the ending of the film was vastly altered to focus more on North Korea and move the attack to the demilitarized zone. This film changed multiple times, it was very malleable, and I think all of these things combined led to a bit of a frustrating production that has almost, I would say, diamonds in the rough. Even though this film was supposed to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the James Bond series, it instead is looked at as the film that caused a total reboot of the character and a shift to Daniel Craig's new, grounded, post-9-11 version of Bond, with Pierce Brosnan quietly exiting the role and not by his own choice. Now we're going to get into the section where Jill and I talk a little bit more about the movie itself as well. I just wanted to establish some background like I do for every Bond movie because the history and I think the context of what's happening at the time are very important to shaping what movie we actually get 
especially when it comes to this franchise. Like always, I do want to talk about the movie with my wife, Jill. Jill, you are my partner. My, Hello. My jinx. I like to think we have a little better chemistry than that. This movie, I think, is what is blamed for Brosnan where they say, well, Brosnan's a great Bond, but a lot of his movies didn't have good writing. Oh. I feel like that only really applies to this film. Yeah, I really liked the first half of the movie, and I loved all the other movies. So Bond was sent to assassinate the villain Colonel Moon of the North Korean army, and the way he did that was he got the blood diamonds from the guy who was supposed to be delivering them to Colonel Moon, and then he pretended to be the delivery guy. But somebody betrayed Bond uh -oh. and sent a little message to the Korean people's cell phone like, hey, that's James Bond, you should kill him. But this kind of level of betrayal, it's something that I think the movie wanted to set it, it really wanted to put it on level with Goldeneye. Mm -hmm. It felt like this movie wanted to have the Goldeneye Alec betrayal again, uh -huh. but there was no connection to the betrayer. There was no connection to really anything. Yeah. So it just comes off as, oh, okay. Yeah. And then th that's about it. It's kind of just a plot point. And then the person who betrays him, the only motivation they have is, ooh, I, I love my boyfriend and I want to be with him even though I am a British agent. Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense going into it. That's something that is unfortunate about this is like for every good thing, there's almost something equally baffling about this movie. Mm. I mean, for the first act, I think it holds together pretty well because the North Korean hovercraft chase was done very well. It's an iconic Bond scene. It made it onto the cover even of a lot of the DVD printings of this movie. Yeah, it was awesome. This movie was kind of like tonally between the original Bond and the Craig era. And because of it, its identity is really weird. It doesn't really know at times if it wants to be this serious drama, you know, kind of like a Jason Bourne story where you don't know who you can trust or a Daniel Craig Bond movie where there's, you know, danger around every corner and maybe the good guys aren't the good guys or if it wants to be a campy, fun, sci-fi Bond film. It's very inconsistent. Yeah, and at parts it felt very outlandish as well. Yeah, and es that- Especially with some of the bad CGI. Well, that kind of gets us into the beginning of the movie because one of the things that had the most potential is pretty much thrown out immediately. Yeah, at the very beginning of the movie, they have Bond be captured by the North Korean government and they have this very serious intro scene about Bond being captured and tortured for 14 months. And then they use the musical intro to kind of show you the torture that he endured in a musical way to keep their rating so that way it wasn't super graphic or anything. I thought that was clever. And I thought the graphics of the musical intro were very interesting because it shows a lot of the uh, like virtual women like helping lift him up to, to help keep him alive during that time. I don't know, I thought it was very symbolic and interesting. Yeah. And then they kind of throw that out. But the Madonna song is so bad. It doesn't fit the tone of the movie that thus far. By the way, Madonna doesn't fit this movie at all. They no. also ramrod Madonna into the movie in a very forced cameo that I think was supposed to be kind of a fun anniversary tie-in, but it makes no sense. But then they also have James Bond randomly, like, sensually touch her back to, like, tie up her corset, and then you never see her again. A lot of this movie feels forced, which sucks because I think we find the movie fun. There, there's so many things we wanted to like, but even the torture scene, you know, you kind of mentioned this to me, and when we were talking about it, he seems to have some kind of PTSD at the beginning, but later on... Yeah, and it was a very dark and gritty, serious beginning to the movie. Yeah. And then they just throw, I'm gonna die another day. And then he goes back to his people, and he's essentially treated terribly. By the way, yeah. M is written so inconsistently in this movie. Yeah, it, she's a huge bitch in this movie. It makes no sense because in The World Is Not Enough, you'd think that James Bond was like her surrogate son. Yeah. Or something, like she was super proud of him. Like, yeah. And in this one, she's like, you're no use to anyone. It's just... We should have let you die in North Korea. I feel like there's elements of this movie, and we'll get into this too, that were affected by the World Trade Center attacks, you know, where they wanted to have it be, does your government really care about you? Does it really even care about its own people? But they used people where that doesn't make sense. Like, I understand that cynical point of view. It's pretty realistic and fair, but that doesn't mean every single person is a cold bastard. And what sucks about this is that M wasn't really portrayed this way up to this point. She had that front about her, but 
But she was a lot softer when it came to Bond. And she did clearly care. Uh -huh. Like, not just about Bond, but about her people mm -hmm. and about the world. Mm -hmm. And in this, it seems like she only cares about the greater good. Like, during the time that he was gone, she put up, like, a big icy wall around her heart and was like, Stupid Bond! Yeah, and stupid everyone. Stupid everyone! It's very weird. I, it's just, a lot of characters are not consistent with where they should have been, I don't think. And the PTSD... It's just dropped. Yeah, they, they mention it a little bit in Havana and Hong Kong, and then they forget about it, and I, he's fine. And I do want to mention, I know, like, I've looked into discussions around this movie because I wanted to know what do other fans think? You know, what do other people think about this? And the general consensus was that they probably didn't go too far in on that because they didn't want to make a depressing movie following the World Trade Center attacks, which I understand. And there actually are parts that we'll get to, like certain lines he says that I think are very good regarding that, showing that Bond bounces back, you know, showing that the world doesn't need to stay on its knees, right? Like the world doesn't need to be crippled by fear just because it gets brought down to its lowest point doesn't mean it can't rise up again. And I thought that was cool. I like that. I like that theme. But because of how unserious the movie is, I also feel like that theme falls flat in a lot of scenes. Yeah. It doesn't actually feel like Bond is rising like a phoenix from the ashes, you know, to be reborn and go back. Because they didn't show him overcome anything. They just kind of showed him breeze past it. It just goes away. That's why I think that this is tonally inconsistent. It doesn't know if it wants to be a more campy film mm -hmm. or if it wants to get into these serious topics. So instead it dances around doing both. It's an idea that Goldeneye was even getting into with Alec betraying Bond. So they had already been working their way there towards a little bit more cynical. They tried to do that in this movie by having Miranda Frost, uh, she's a, an MI6 agent, basically be the one who was betraying Bond, but her entire motivation is just she met Colonel Moon when she did fencing when she was younger and she decided she loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really It's against... just she doesn't seem like she has a ton of motivation. No, I'm not against her motivation and I'm not against Moon's motivation either, but these are very non-memorable villains mm -hmm. and their self-serving actions are very surface level mm -hmm. compared to people, you know, from even the previous three Bond films. I feel like they're just very surface level villains that are not that deep. Yeah, and I feel like they were very forgettable. One of the villains that I actually really liked was Zhao, though. Yeah. And he didn't get enough screen time. I love the face-off on the bridge at the beginning when basically Bond says, they're trading you for me. You know, you're going to get what's coming to you. And then Zhao's like, not as soon as you will. And then they don't really run into each other for quite a while again. Yeah. Like, Zhao they, just kind of takes a backseat and Graves shows up. We, we run into him in Havana and we see him getting... DNA replacement surgery to become a white man. For five minutes. And For then, five minutes. And then he's kind of just gone then, until the yeah. final act. And then you see him again. He's like partially with a skin bleached with blue eyes with his diamonds still in his face. So he's like a white Korean man then. And then he doesn't really do anything anymore other than just stand next to Gustav and be like, oh, I'm evil. I think Zhao was kind of designed interestingly aesthetically but it seems to me like the diamonds in his face it was an attempt to make odd job or jaws again like a classic bond henchman a bond villain henchman with some sort of memorable thing about and him. a gimmick i think also the thing that annoyed me about zhao is when uh james bond kind of escapes from mi6 he goes to hong kong and basically he says to them Oh, well, I know Zhao has been giving you guys trouble, so I'm going after him to murder him, and I'll let you know how it goes. He never talks to him again. Yeah, and then you never see those people again in the movie. The Chinese intelligence. And it, they made it seem like Zhao was some big bad guy who was, like, going to Hong Kong and ruining their lives and ruining other people's lives, and then yeah. you don't really see any of what he's done. No. He you... doesn't really have much of a backstory. What sucks, too, though, is that in behind-the-scenes footage, producer Barbara Broccoli was actually talking about the process of writing these movies. We watched a lot of the behind the scenes stuff mm -hmm. to make these reviews and she's directly involved in that basically they look at what the world is currently worried about what it's going to be worried about and then they try and make bond relevant with every movie to that time period that said it's actually frustrating because yeah dna altering like things like this cloning ideas with messing with the human genome technology science fiction all of these were big ideas at the time, but most of them aren't accurately represented or really fleshed out in a way that makes them feel believable. Uh -huh. 
you know, a lot of the times Bond tackles ideas, but it still makes the villain's plot feel somewhat believable. Mm -hmm. This went so far out there into the future of what was possible that the things it was tackling still aren't really happening. And they needed a lot of CGI for this movie, and the technology for CGI wasn't there at the time for the things that they really wanted to do. One thing with the villain, with Colonel Moon, is somehow when Moon faked his death at the beginning of the movie, he somehow got away from North Korea it, without anyone seeing him get out of North Korea, you know, one of the most heavily guarded countries in the entire world, and made it to somehow South Korea and then Havana to become a white man. Like, literally not a joke, he just becomes a white man with DNA altering. Right. And it's kind of ridiculous when you put it that way, and it's also hard for me to believe that he was somehow able to get out of the country without anyone knowing he was still alive, especially his own father. You said that you thought the plot might have gone over better if it was more about advances in cosmetic surgery instead of them literally switching out the DNA inside of somebody. I think it would have been- Yeah, it, it comes off really far-fetched. It would have made it? more sense. Yeah. And you would have been able to have more believable actors. It also didn't need to be this complicated. Mm -hmm. Every element of the villain's plot is overly complicated, by the way. Yeah. If you look back at the previous three villains, yeah, they're a little complex, but they're not cartoon villain out there. Mm -hmm. This is something I also read about behind the scenes in the you know, behind the scenes book of some kind of hero or some kind of a hero, which I think is really interesting. I recommend to any fans of these movies because they get into a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on with them. The director, Lee Tamahori, which I didn't even put in Jill in my script, he wanted this to be more sci-fi. He wanted this to be more comic booky and more action, but the original writers didn't. And it ended up coming off more campy than anything. And because of that, you can see the conflicting visions. Yeah. You can see the scenes that were left alone to be grounded and the scenes that were tampered with to be larger than life. This movie does have one of my favorite James Bond lines in the entire, I would say at the very least, the Pierce Brosnan movies, but probably any of them. This is actually when he meets with M near the middle of the movie and M is kind of saying, oh, looks like you're useful again. Looks like you figured things out. And Bond kind of shoots down her cynical worldview. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it because this is where I think the movie excelled and where it could have tied into the tragedies happening in the world at the time. The fear around terror, the fear around North Korea, even the, the fear around the Middle East. And it changed everything and it changed national security, it changed international relations. And something I loved was when Bond is talking to M and she essentially says, the world changed while you were away. And it's referencing the 14 months that happened. Worth noting, it was about 14 months before the release of this movie that 9-11 happened almost directly. Uh -huh. So that is, the 14 months is a reference to 9-11. Mm -hmm. And in response to her saying that the world changed while you were away, Bond just says, not for me. And I really love this because this is a very deep line. This is probably one of the deepest things in the entire film. And it's over in a flash. Mm -hmm. It's just gone. You know, obviously they're they not going to- really mention it again. And they're not going to sit down and like talk about and hash out 9-11. But, but I think there could have been some interesting plot points to do with that. Yeah, because this kind of shows that Bond maintains his optimism. Yeah. He's not perfect. He's very clearly rattled by what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And in scenes like this, you can tell he's still rattled a little bit by the PTSD how M has treated him, even in their interaction, it's more cold. Mm -hmm. I thought that was done really, really well. And to show him kind of saying like the world, like I said before, doesn't need to stay down, doesn't need to stay on its knees. Mm -hmm. We can still fight the bad guys and not everyone's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. I like that, that optimism from Bond. He's not perfect. Bond is not a perfectly adjusted man, but the idea that he still wants the best for the world. And even, you know, when General Moon in the beginning says, your country forgot about you, they deny your very existence. Why do you still stay silent? Why are you still loyal? And he's still loyal. Like, I really- Because he cares about the country. And he cares about the world. Yeah. And I really, really like that element, especially of Brosnan's Bond. I think the emotion shows through in his delivery of this line. Mm -hmm. And there should have been way more stuff like this. Like this Yeah, is, they should have shown more of that with his character. This is a grounded moment. And I think the grounded moments in this movie, a lot of them are the best parts. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this really showed that humanity of who James Bond was in just three or four words. So this movie really starts to fall apart for both of us when Jinx is introduced. Halle Berry 
I don't love her as an actress, but I don't hate her. I thought she was really fun as Storm, despite some of the cheese in the X-Men movies. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, the writers really wanted Jinx, her character, to be female Bond. I mean, they were even setting up a spin-off, actually, that was in talks for a while, where they wanted to spin off from this movie and have a movie about Jinx. Oh. And one, I'm kind of glad that didn't happen. Me too. Because this character is very forced. But two, she's... She's James Bond with none of the charm. And you know, like, none of the cleverness. Yeah, like every line that she has that's supposed to be some clever one-liner is unclever. You and know, not funny. There's no real, uh, I would say, chemistry between her and other characters like her and Bond. It felt like a very circumstantial relationship where they were the only person each other had at the time, so we may as well sleep with each other. Electra King was already a very terrifying and strong presence. You had Wei Lin from Tomorrow Never Dies, who is excellent. Even Natalia from Goldeneye, I thought was a stronger female character than Jinx. Jinx is just kind of here and takes up room and makes you roll your eyes it's when like she's she, on screen. It, it made me feel like she kind of just wanted to take up room, like she wanted to be Bond and do all of the mission by herself. You yeah. Know? But she couldn't do it for some reason. Like she got caught in the water or... Um, <laughs> she got caught multiple times. Yeah, she actually, she did get caught multiple times. And it's like, she thought she was as good as Bond, but then couldn't get past the first couple of villains without getting tortured. She was Diet Bond. Yeah, I did also want to mention though, I do like her intro where she walks out of the water in that bikini because it's an homage to Honey Rider's appearance in Dr. No. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those fun anniversary tidbits of the film. And I thought that was really interesting and fun that they paid homage to a previous Bond girl. With the writing and the acting and everything combined. It didn't it, fit her personality. It doesn't work. No. It doesn't work at all. It comes off very forced. Yes. One scene I absolutely love is when Bond meets with the new Q, who was previously R, and he gets several gadgets, including the car, which I love this car. I love the gadgets in this movie. I thought they were very well done. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people criticize this movie for an over-reliance on gadgets and the invisible car and stuff. Those were things I actually liked But he's a film. secret agent. Of course he's gonna rely on his gadgets. Yeah, it was fun. You know, I thought that the carryover and the respect of the original Q and the lines, by the way, in that scene was really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, R, who's now Q, is his own character. It carries over from The World Is Not Enough. Unfortunately, we don't actually see him appear again in films after this, uh, but this scene is really fun because it kind of ties into the Bond anniversary aspect. Q gives Bond a watch he estimates to be his 20th, a reference to this being the 20th film, and Bond even tinkers with a jetpack from Thunderball, asking if it even still works. I thought that was fun. Which I think is fun and interesting, though sometimes it kind of makes me think like, isn't it kind of weird that the technology advanced so much, but Bond has not aged a bit? Yeah, I, I feel like I always just would rather view most Bond actors as just their own character, but this does kind of tie up that continuity, mm -hmm. you know, of that loose canon. But, you know, other than Live and Let Die, this was actually the first Bond movie not to feature Desmond Llewellyn. We talked previously about how he tragically passed away in a car accident in 1999 mm -hmm. after a book signing. And that hits really hard when you actually watch his exit scene from the previous film. But we have a whole segment on that already in that review. Mm -hmm. It's just worth mentioning that this guy, he was awesome. Desmond Llewellyn was such a great cue. It's really sad to not see him in the movie because mm -hmm. um, as a movie that wants to reference previous movies a lot to be like, look at the history of our franchise. This is an anniversary special. You don't have one of your biggest you know, faces ever. And, there's nothing you could do about it. I mean, obviously his passing was a tragedy, but it's, it's just a missed opportunity and sad that there was nothing really except a passing mention to him. Yeah, I agree. I wish there was a little bit more of a memorial to him. I did also want to mention the Icarus laser. Um, it's an idea that is rooted in real science that they were actually working on at the time. There are supposedly space weapons in the works and throughout history there that have been worked on. Kinetic bombardment is still talked about today as an option that annihilates areas of the planet without the use of nuclear weapons, for example. That said, the tech wasn't there to make most of this plot work. Uh, I felt like that the CGI for the, the laser looked kind of, well, I guess very, very fake. fake. The laser breaks the ice and Bond has to surf on the water again. 
and I found th I found that extremely cheesy, and also the CGI for the water was terrible. It looked horrible. It, it was it, really bad. It's one of the worst looking scenes I've seen in a Bond movie. It was very much overreaching for the time. It's like yeah, it's like people back then thought the CGI looked way better than it actually did. I do want to say that there were pretty amazing car chases in this movie. I love that they actually drove the car through the ice palace. I know it's ridiculous, but I thought it was really cool. I, you know, we watched part of the documentary of how they made the car chase and they directly were stripping these cars down, taking the engines out, installing four wheel drive. I thought that was really cool and interesting because we've never really seen a car chase on ice in many movies, to, in in my opinion, before. I thought the car chase kind of proves that Lee Tamahori had sort of the vision of Fast and Furious. You know, he, he was kind of doing stuff with cars mm -hmm. that I think was very impressive. And the stunt people even told him at the time and the tech people were telling him at the time, this kind of real life car chase in a huge film like this on ice it's not something that's really been done before. Mm -hmm. This film kind of pioneered that in a lot It was of ways. incredible, and I love car chases in movies. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why I love Fast and Furious. And I also wanted to mention that they had like four different cars to be able to do the filming for this. And you actually, when you watch the behind the scenes, you see them total one of the cars in oh, yeah. an actual iceberg. They actually filmed it on real ice. Something you wanted to talk about was that this film other than Tomorrow Never Dies, is probably the only Brosnan era Bond film to not be disappointing with its car. Mm -hmm. That's actually very true because uh, they they introduce the car in all of the other movies and then he doesn't really use it much. It's kind of wasted in Goldeneye and he just doesn't really tend to use it much. They were used it a little bit towards the end of The World Is Not Enough, but then it just gets wasted right away it again. It gets sawed in half. It, yeah. it was cool, but in Tomorrow Never Dies, where he was remote controlling it, I thought that was... That was awesome. That's pretty much tied with this car scene, I think, if not slightly better yes. in terms of its believability and fun. But these are the only two out of the four that actually have that classic Bond car scene and do it really I think, well. I think it's really awesome that this car was able to turn invisible, and that's something in real life that at least the U.S. military has been trying to do actually recently is make some of their things be able to use mirrors to appear more invisible. Essentially, yeah, like, As like mirror a camouflage. cameras. Yeah. yeah, they use cameras to project an image onto the screens on the outside of a bomber or things like that. I found that very interesting. Yeah, at the time, by the way, this was heavily criticized. They said nothing will ever be able to do that. But things are starting to be able to do that, which I think is really cool. And I think that in retrospect, it makes that car scene even cooler. The finale of this movie in general completely jumped the shark. You know, Gustav Graves randomly wears a mech suit and basically it has the Icarus laser activation in it. It has a button on it that will uh, activate a shock gauntlet like he thinks he's Emperor Palpatine. The plane flies directly into the laser that Graves is shooting down but the plane is fine for quite a while because the plot protects the plane for long enough for the plot to conclude. Uh -huh. The laser can destroy all the mines in the DMZ in one swipe but it can't take out their plane. Everything from where Bond and Jinx sneak onto the plane on is just awful. Mm -hmm. And it's really a shame because the scenes right before that where Bond defeats Zhao in the car chase as was pretty cool. unrealistic as it might be, were pretty cool. Uh -huh. You know, General Moon is an interesting character I think you wanted to talk about for a minute as well. Yeah, we don't see enough of him. He allows the torture of Bond, so he's not exactly a great guy but he's also shown to have some amount of honor because when his son as Graves reveals his identity to General Moon, first of all, he's shook that his son has become a white man randomly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, General Moon tries to kill him in order to prevent a world war. And I thought this was surprisingly nuanced as North Koreans are almost always in the media just portrayed as heartless villains from a scary country that loves war. And unfortunately, this should have been a really, I would say, emotional scene. But I think swapping Moon out, I'm sorry, Colonel Moon out for Gustav Graves kind of takes that away a little bit. Yeah. I think that you don't really feel the familial connection as much between these two. Now yeah, because it's a completely different actor. I do want to say that I know we've talked a lot about the negatives in this movie, but it does use gadgets really well. And I do think it's very fun for doing that. Mm -hmm. This is a rewatchable movie. I don't think it's just a train wreck that isn't fun. I liked the movie almost all the way through until pretty much the third act. Yeah, and then at that point, the only fun thing really is the car chase. I also loved the gadgets. I loved that he used 
used his watch to blow up the diamond briefcase and that was how he made Zhao kind of have the what they called really expensive acne. I actually yeah. thought that joke was really funny. Yeah, and he also had a glass shattering ring. I thought this was really cool where it emitted a high frequency. He used it to save Jinx and he used it to break through the floor in a climactic action scene. We talked about the invisible car already. I love it. I know a lot of people criticize it. I don't think it's a problem in this movie. I thought, I thought the car it, was awesome. I thought it was one of the things that was actually fun in this film. Uh -huh. But the very end of this film is just frustrating because it's the end of Brosnan's bond in film. Not up to his choice, by the way. He wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. This is something I'll talk about in a future video. They probably they actually contacted him, invited him back for a fifth movie, and then rescinded it later. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's like what they did with the, the director. Apted. Yeah, they did that to Michael Apted as well. I want to talk about the worst written scene in this movie, which the is end? also the final scene. <laughs> oh. You don't see Jinx and Bond. Um, at first, it's kind of like a, a black screen, and you just hear her saying, Oh, come on, leave it in just a little longer, please. This, it feels by the so way, good. this ties into how stupid the innuendo is in this movie. It's like the person who wrote that had no idea what sex was. They thought was, it was a cake, like in Family Guy. It's like they were trying really hard to make like a sexual innuendo, but they didn't understand sex. And it was like a 12 year old boy wrote it and was like, What do they do? Oh, yeah, they, they like, they'll leave it in. That's a funny joke, right? Yeah. It's it's so weird. And by the way, we thought the Christmas comes once a year was funny. Uh, I, yeah, from, I thought that was a funny joke, from, actually. From I thought that end. one was clever. People didn't like that one, though. Yeah, from the end of the previous Bond film. Mm -hmm. I think that this era of Bond is really fun but frustrating in some ways because there were so many characters that didn't carry over that I thought would have been really fun to see, especially in this movie. You know, obviously, Bond girls usually leave. But there was originally a plan, again, probably a future video, to even uh, have Waylin appear in this movie. Which would have made the movie better because I love Waylin. And it was going to be kind of a, another anniversary thing, you know, mm -hmm. hearkening back to a previous movie. It feels like this movie is constantly trying to reference back to old Bond stuff, but it neglects characters from the Brosnan era in order to do it, and it mm -hmm. kind of gives them the finger. Even M barely in the movie and just a dick like we yeah, said yeah. i just feel like there's a lot of inconsistent characterization but what sucks about this movie so much is that i think pierce brosnan was so comfortable in the role he did such a good job every time he's on screen he is the shining light of this movie he's the reason i would watch it again like pierce brosnan's james bond was amazing in the way he acted as james bond and he was very captivating for me i kind of fell in love with him the first time i saw him in goldeneye he's just a very charming and captivating character and so I feel like that that really carried this movie. If it hadn't been for Pierce Brosnan being in this role, this movie would have been a mess. He got blamed for a lot of this. It feels like inconsistent direction, lack of finding a director that they wanted with no offense to Tom Ahori, him being basically the 10th choice that they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, ditching Michael Apted from The World Is Not Enough trying to decide if they wanted to be sci-fi, grounded, post 9-11, pre-9-11. A lot of conflicting tonal elements. And things that just fell apart during the entire production, changing yeah. the script multiple times, reshooting things. It all kind of goes together into a shoddily written script to make this movie mostly hated. Yeah. I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. I think it's still a fun movie. I don't hate it. I think Pierce Brosnan deserved a fifth movie after this to save his reputation because I feel like he didn't deserve all of the hate that this script got. No, he really didn't. And it's unfortunate. I'm glad he appeared in Everything or Nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that he got to kind of, you know, send off his bond on those terms. But it's really sad to see. And it's also kind of heartbreaking to read his statements after this where he was excited to return for another film. And then they just ruined it. And they just kicked him out. Yeah. I love Daniel Craig and I love his era of Bond, but I really dislike how Brosnan was treated near mm -hmm. the end of his Bond tenure. Uh-huh. And I do think that Brosnan deserves more credit than he gets. If you've stuck around to this point of the video, that means you either fell asleep, which thanks for the watch time, or maybe you just don't hate the sound of our voices and you thought this was a fun video. This does conclude our reviews of the Brosnan era of Bond movies. That said, there are games we want to talk about. There are other movies we want to talk about, including the Daniel Craig Bond movies. And we do have several ways you can help support the channel if you want to. 
Movie reviews like this would not be possible without our members and patrons, so I do want to show them here during the thank you section. And I also want to say that we actually have several other ways to support our channel, like we do have a Fortnite support a creator code, which is DJAY123. You enter that in the support a creator option. It actually helps us out a lot because YouTube is very inconsistent and these things take a lot of work. We do also have a store, cosmobunny.shop, where we sell all kinds of fun resin coasters, trays, keychains. These are repurposed from comic books, manga, even magazines, by the way, like video game magazines or entertainment magazines. So these are things that local stores are not able to sell in our area. And what we do is we get them either for free or for dirt cheap at a discount because they are literally going in the trash. In Minnesota, where we live, a lot of these things end up in the actual trash, not even in the recycling. So what we do is we make fun things out of it, and then we recycle the parts of it that we don't use as well into the actual recycling. I also make handmade jewelry, and I do take commissions on that. I make beaded jewelry. So if you wanted something specific and custom, you could always message me and say, hey, I want this type of beaded necklace or something. And we will say no, like, J or like Bugs Bunny. I was gonna say like James Bond. <laughs> I'm just kidding, we'll probably say yes. <laughs> but yeah, I have a lot of awesome handmade jewelry. It's one of my biggest passions. And you can use the same code DJAY123 for 10% off of your first purchase on my website. Yeah, we absolutely love making stuff there. We love making stuff here. So we hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe for more content. Also, though this is a variety channel and you probably found it through this review or something else, I make all kinds of stuff on this channel like video game videos, comic book videos. More and movie reviews. More movie reviews we're gonna work on. And I do have a new channel, JRPG, which is J-A-Y-R-P-G, where I cover role-playing games and role-playing ish games like games that are in that realm a lot of ones especially from the eastern side of the world yeah, which are awesome dark souls the souls born franchise mm -hmm. bloodborne all kinds of elden ring stuff like that mega man we recently made a video about a mega man rpg game. that new stellar blade yep. game kingdom that's gonna come hearts. out i'm so excited kingdom hearts of course mm -hmm. final fantasy so if you want to check that out that's in the description down below along with a discord you can join all kinds of fun stuff a lot of people don't check out the description but if you did have fun here tons of fun stuff there that we'd love to see you on. Hope you have a fantastic day, and as always, everyone, stay shway. Yay!